going to record this. Um, I'm going to get started with a little information for everybody about Southern Lit Alliance. So uh, excuse me while I attempt to share my screen. I'm not as fast as some people are doing this, I'll tell you. So <laughs> we've had a lot of techie stuff to learn, haven't we? We have. It's It's been quite a journey. So um, Southern Little Alliance, uh, we have been around since 1952 and various names and uh, doing various things, but always have been around with Southern literature. I want to thank our presenting sponsor who has uh, helped with our Southbound author talk series. So that's uh, Henderson, Hutchison and McCullough. And also want to thank uh, Arts Build as our local arts uh, fundraiser around here that supports the arts and the Tennessee Arts Commission. They uh, provide us with grants and really support all of our programs. So, and also we want to mention the specialty plates that are available that all the specialty plates, even if you pick UT, money goes to support the arts. So you all love that. So our mission is to provide engaging literary arts experiences to encourage passionate readers and writers. We really want the next generation to keep reading and keep loving literature like we do. We're known for several um, programs, particularly our Southward Literary Feast. People may know it as a celebration of Southern literature. And it's with the Fellowship of Southern Writers, an honorary organization with almost 50 members throughout the South and even across the country that are all Southern literature in some way. And this festival is panel discussions, readings, book signings, music, all kinds of fun things and ways to connect with authors. And this fall, we are having what we call our Southward abridged version, which is a little smaller. Um, it, right now we're having some in-person and some virtual. Uh, we are Happy to announce tonight, Natasha Traithway is going to be our virtual keynote uh, talk about her memoir that she recently wrote, uh, I think it's called Memorial Drive, uh, as well as some of her poetry. So we're going to keep it going until we can get everybody back together. Our Young Southern Student Writers Contest has also been going on a long time. It's for grades kindergarten through 12. And we get almost 4,000 submissions and they're all read by the UT English department and their graduate students. And we pick around three to 400 for a special award and have a ceremony to congratulate them and encourage them to keep writing. Our Southbound Author Lecture Series, what we're doing tonight is part of that. Hopefully we will get back to in-person soon. Um, but in the meantime, we're doing these virtuals. And, and the good part is we've had authors from all over the country that may not have been able to stop by Chattanooga. So some other programs, uh, we're doing workshops in area jails. We have a young adult genre festival that's going to be September 16th coming up. It's virtual. We have creative writing workshops for teens. We do plays on books for kids. Even have a book drive for Moccasin Bend Hospital and their um, patients. So we're serving almost 7,000 people a year um, in pre-COVID, but working toward that even in spite of it. So just a little bit, we couldn't do all this without support. Um, some of you have donated as part of signing up today and we really appreciate that. This gives you an idea of where your money has gone and um, how much we appreciate everything that you're doing. Okay, so we'll stop that for right now. Um, now I uh, want to introduce our guest tonight, Susan Cushman is with us from Memphis. So a little bit about Susan. Uh, she is originally from Jackson, Mississippi, but has been in Memphis since 1988, where she raised her children and has, has now grandchildren in other places in the country. Uh, she's been uh, in a writer and more late in life, which is awesome to see her start up and gives anybody encouragement that might want to start writing. Uh, she's been co-director of the Oxford 
Mississippi Creative Nonfiction Conferences and also the Memphis Creative Nonfiction Workshops. She has uh, been at many festivals, including the Decatur Book Festival, Southern Festival of Books, the Mississippi Book Festival, and Louisiana Book Festival, among other appearances and conferences and uh, things throughout the Southeast. Her four published books that she has written are, of course, John and Mary Margaret, where she's going to talk tonight. Also, Friends of the Library, which is short stories. Uh, Tangles and Plaques, A Mother and Daughter Face Alzheimer, which is a memoir. And Cherry Bomb, another novel. And she's also uh, collected and edited a lot of anthologies and continues to do that in her hometown of Memphis, as well as sharing her talents with some older people in assisted living, which I think is a, a great thing to share with. So Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you get start telling us about your book and yourself. Thanks. Thanks so much, Linda, on the Southern Lit Alliance. I, I'm sad not to be there in person. I was really looking forward to it, but I'm really thankful for Zoom and Facebook Live and all these tools that keep us connected during this difficult time and uh, and it can really be fun. So thanks to all of y'all that are watching virtually from wherever you are at the end of your work day at home or elsewhere. So um, I grew up, as Linda said, in Jackson, Mississippi in the 50s, coming of age in the apocalyptic 60s, which gave me lots of fodder uh, for writing. Um, I was a reporter and eventually business manager on my high school newspaper staff. So in the 60s, I thought, I'm going to be a reporter. I'm going to be a journalist. At the same time, I was acting in plays. Thought I saw stars in my eyes, and I thought, no, I'll be an actor. And uh, I didn't end up being a journalist or an actor, but those things did inspire uh, what I did end up doing, writing. Um, after a short stint at Ole Miss at the University of Mississippi, I was just there one year. 1969 and 70, because my freshman year was my husband and my fiance at the time, his senior year. So when he graduated in 70, we got married young. I was just 19 and he was 21. And we went back to Jackson, Mississippi for him to do medical school and residency for seven years uh, while I worked doing a lot of freelance writing, uh, newsletters, um, some volunteer work some writing for magazines, oh, and a little bit of um, nonfiction writing for corporations, which I found to be boring, but it, it paid the rent, you know, those types of things. Um, also, I was a stay-at-home mom. We adopted three children from 1977 into the 80s, and um, so I was a stay-at-home mom for a lot of years because my husband's career was so busy, and I felt like one of us needed to be at home, and so um, we moved to Memphis in 88, and that's where our children spent most of their, their school age years. Finally, in 2001, it's hard to believe, that was 20 years ago, our last child graduated college and I was ready to do my late life career and do the things I'd always wanted to do. And um, then I got cancer. <laughs> Fortunately, that was, uh, I was treated and was over that pretty quickly. Then our oldest son uh, went to Iraq when the war was started. So I had a little bit of drama, trauma going on that slowed me down a bit. And so before I started writing, um, I decided to do some art. I think a lot of people start, a lot of creative people will start in one area of creativity and then move into another one. We had converted from our Presbyterian faith to Eastern Orthodox Church. And I was fascinated by icons. So I studied the art of iconography at monasteries and began, it's called writing icons because you're writing the life of the saints with paint, painting icons and teaching icon workshops. And I did that for a number of years. And then I retired from that to write full time, which is what I really had always wanted to do. So I started with newsletters, as I mentioned earlier, and um, mainly for nonprofits. And then I went into blogging. I think I started my first blog in 2007, and I took it really seriously because when you write in a blog, it is published for anyone to read. And I had three themes, Mental Health Monday, 
writing on Wednesday and faith on Friday. And I had a lot of followers and um, which turned into helping me build a platform for my later work, my, my later published books. The first thing that happened was my mother had Alzheimer's and uh, the last eight years of her life, she was in a nursing home down in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi, which is 200 miles south of me in Memphis. So I spent a whole lot of time on that highway, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, long distance caregiving for her. And I wrote blog posts constantly about that process. 60 of those blog posts became a book in January of 2017, Tangles and Plaques, A Mother and Daughter Face Alzheimer's. And that happened because some of my blog readers suggested that I turn that into a book. And I often say that was my easiest book to write, but my hardest book to have lived through. You know, it was easy to write because it was done. I basically organized them, wrote an introduction, found a publisher, and there it came. And that happened as I was working with the publisher for my first novel, Cherry Bomb. So, you know, for many years, I had tried to write a memoir about some of the things that happened to me uh, dramatically in my life, traumatically, childhood sexual abuse and some other things. And I just couldn't get comfortable with um, going public with all the facts of all of that. And I didn't want to do what some people think you can just take a memoir, change the names and call it a novel. And that's not what a novel is. And so instead, what I did is I let some of those experiences inform a novel. And the way I did that was by asking myself two questions that I've been continuing to ask myself as I write fiction. Those two questions are, I mean, two words, one question, what if? So in that first case, what if a little girl escapes from a religious cult and throws up graffiti as a cry for help? What if she gets a scholarship to study art at the Savannah College of Art and Design? What if she is mentored by famous abstract expressionist artist, Elaine de Koenig? What if she's introduced to iconography and visits a monastery to take a workshop? What if there turns out to be a relationship between the girl, the artist, and a nun at the monastery? What if their lives are touched by a weeping icon? So I answered all of those questions as I wrote and published my first novel, Cherry Bomb, which took about six years to write. And one reason it took so long was at one point, I was working with a New York literary agent. I was really excited because I had queried, for writers out there, you'll, you'll be interested in this, I had queried 100 literary agents for this book, 25 of whom asked to read the full manuscript which was real encouraging until 24 of them said, we think the writing's really good, but we, don't, we can't find a niche for this book. I don't know how to sell it, blah, blah, blah. So this one agent who loved it and wanted to work with me, but what happened was I quickly realized she wanted to turn it into a hardcore commercial fiction book. And I wanted it to preserve its Southern literary flavor and his spiritual aspect to it. So eventually I had to leave her, which I hated to do because there might've been a deal with HarperCollins or you know, somebody big like that. And instead I went with a small press out of Mississippi where the publisher and editor that I worked with really got my vision, my vision for the novel. So from an integrity point of view, I'm very happy with Cherry Bomb, my first novel. I just wish it had been able to get out you know, to a bigger world. So my publisher, who I said lived in a small town in Mississippi, asked me to, to take Cherry Bomb on the road on a small book tour to visit friends of the library groups in small towns all over Mississippi. Well, I'm from Jackson, which is a fairly good sized city, Jackson, Mississippi, and I lived in Oxford when I was at Ole Miss, but I had never been to most of these towns, Eupora, Winona, um, West Point, Pontotoc. So before I went to each one, I studied a bit about their history. I discovered famous people who had lived there. I've discovered historic buildings and museums that had to do with blues and jazz and literature because Mississippi is full of all of that. So I went on the trip and what I would have usually done is come back from each of those visits and write a blog post about it. 
And as I started to do that, after my visit, I believe it was to Eupora, the first town I went to, instead of writing the blog post, which is nonfiction, which is a report of what you just did, I said, what if, what if I invent a fictional author and I name her Adele, she visits those towns and she becomes involved in the lives of some of those wounded people. What if this author falls in love with each town with its history and its beautiful historical buildings and its famous people? What if she uses her own experiences to help her fictional characters who are dealing with issues like Alzheimer's, cancer, sexual abuse, adoption, alcoholism, and homelessness, all of which have touched my life in one way or another. So I wrote those short stories and I published them in a short story collection called Friends of the Library. Then along came 2020 and the COVID pandemic. Fortunately, I had just about finished my book tour for Friends of the Library when everything shut down. And you know, being isolated in that bad of a situation for a writer, if you can focus, if you can quit thinking about everything that's happening out there and be glad that you've got uh, the quiet and a place and a time to write. So I sat down and I asked myself again, oh, and some readers of Friends of the Library really liked one of those 10 stories a lot. And they wanted me to expand it into a novel. It was a story about John and Mary Margaret. So my new novel, John and Mary Margaret, was born. I'm going to read an excerpt from the author's note in the back of the book that tells a little bit more about it. It starts with a quote by my fellow Jackson, Mississippi author, Eudora Welty, who said, every writer, like everybody else, thinks he's living through the crisis of the ages. To write honestly and with all our powers is the least we can do and the most. While I wrote this book while isolated during the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring and summer of 2020, and yes, I thought I was living through the crisis of the ages, as Ms. Welty wrote. Parallel to the health crisis was a growing unrest in our country as protests erupted nationwide in response to the killing of Blacks, uh, black, unarmed Black men by white police officers. The inequality and mistreatment of Blacks started in the 1500s when the first African slaves were brought to what would become South Carolina. 500 years later, the descendants of those slaves who were legally freed in 1862 are still fighting for justice and equality. And so now for a word about John Abbott and Mary Margaret Sutherland. They are totally fictional characters. Of course, Mary Margaret's life mirrors my own childhood and coming of age in Jackson pledging Delta 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 sorority at Ole Miss in the late 1960s, she and I share lives of white privilege and dreams of becoming writers. But that's where the similarity ends. The inspiration for John Abbott does come from two historical figures, Don Cole and Kenneth Mayfield, two of the Ole Miss Eight who were arrested and expelled for protesting on campus in February of 1970. So what happened with that protest and again, it was in February of 70, my, my freshman year at Ole Miss, there was a group called Up With People and they had a concert on campus at Fulton Chapel. My husband and I went to the concert, just remember the group, don't remember anything disruptive happening. This was 51 years ago. And when I was doing research to write this book, several places I read about this protest and how 60 black students were arrested taken to jail. Some of them were expelled. Some of them were denied their diplomas, even though they had earned all the credits. So when I read all of that, I said to my husband, I said, do you remember any of this? How could we have missed this happening? And he said, no. I mean, there's no way we would have missed, you know, according to what I read, they marched up the aisle of Fulton Chapel. Some of them went up on stage, took the microphone away from the, the musicians and spoke. Then all the blue flashing lights were out there and they were arrested. I mean, there's no way we would have missed that. And yet I was reading that it happened. So I started asking four or five other people, friends of mine who had been at Ole Miss at the time. It took about the sixth or seventh person who remembered what happened. The concert went for more than one night. And we just happened to be there on the first night before the protest happened. 
So the protest happened the next night. And so Don Cole and Kenneth Mayfield, I especially love um, Don's story because he went, because he was expelled and he had to go finish his degree in another college. When he did, he returned to Ole Miss and taught mathematics there for decades. He just retired in the last year or two, which just really impressed me with his commitment to try to make a difference and try to make a change in, in his home state of Mississippi. So John and Mary Margaret, it's a rare insider's look into the white privilege bubble of a young girl growing up in Jackson, Mississippi, participating in sorority life on the Ole Miss campus. But it's also a candid portrayal of a young black boy from Memphis who follows his dreams to study law at the predominantly white university. So as I wrote their stories, I continued to ask myself, what if? What if their shared love for literature blossoms into an ill-fated romance? What if I keep this fictional author of Adele who traveled through those 10 towns in Mississippi? What if I keep her on in the role of a reliable observer narrator in this book, using her as a fictional device by which John and Mary Margaret share their stories with the reader? And as the book opens, Adele speaks to their book club in Harbortown, the new urban neighborhood on the Mississippi River in downtown Memphis, where I live today. She meets with John and Mary Margaret after the book club meeting, and they begin to tell their stories starting back in the 1950s in Memphis for John and in Jackson for Mary Margaret. What if 14-year-old Mary Margaret has a chance meeting with the famous Southern Arthur Eudora Welty in the summer of 1963, who lives in her neighborhood in Jackson, Mississippi? This is the historic Bellhaven neighborhood. And I actually lived there in the 70s as a newlywed. Miss Welty's house was right across the street from Bellhaven College, which is now Bellhaven University, where I continued my education after leaving Ole Miss after one year. So I never met Miss Welty. I wish I had. I'd seen her at the Jitney Jungle grocery store. I was too embarrassed to go up and introduce myself. So I decided I'm going to live through. Mary Margaret vicariously a little bit. So I'm going to read an excerpt about what happened then. This was 1963 when Mary Margaret was 14. She wanted to be a writer. Maybe it started in junior high when she had a story published in her school's literary journal. By 10th grade, she was a feature writer for her high school newspaper where she would end up with an editor's job her senior year. She even traveled to Chicago on a train to a National High School Journalism Conference that year. While many of her best friends were busy on the cheerleading squad or the drill team, Mary Margaret spent most of her free time reading. It's not that she wasn't pretty enough to be a cheerleader. She was one of the most beautiful girls in the school with her silky golden hair and sky blue eyes and perfect figure but she loved books. She especially loved Southern literature and had been over the moon excited when she struck up a friendship in the summer of 1963 with one of Mississippi's most famous authors, her neighbor, Eudora Welty. Miss Welty's house was only a few blocks from the Sutherlands in the historic Bellhaven neighborhood, but her first and completely serendipitous meeting with Miss Welty happened a few blocks away at their neighborhood Jitney Jungle grocery store. Miss Welty was struggling with a bag of groceries as she dug around in her purse for her car keys when Mary Margaret approached her in the grocery store parking lot. Um, may I help you? Oh yes, please. I should have gotten my keys out of my pocketbook before leaving the store. Can you hold this bag for me? Taking the sack of groceries from Miss Welty's hand, Mary Margaret couldn't believe her luck. Of course, all the kids in the neighborhood knew who she was. She was known as the popsicle lady because she gave out popsicles to kids who came by her house during the steamy hot summer months. But Mary Margaret always thought that was rude of the other kids, so she didn't join them. Once she began to read Miss Welty's short stories in junior high, she was hooked. And now to meet her in person was like Christmas in July. Would you like to come by my house for some sweet tea later? Miss Welty asked as Mary Margaret placed the groceries in her car. Oh my, she blushed. I would love to, but I wouldn't want to interrupt your work. Miss Welty laughed. Oh goodness, honey, I never get any writing done in the afternoon. The early morning hours are best while the subconscious is still alive with dreams 
and the brain is most open to creativity. In fact, you could just ride home with me now if you'd like, unless you need to be somewhere. Are you shopping for your mother? Oh no, I was actually just going to the jitney for a snack. Mom does the grocery shopping in our family. I would love to join you. Oh, do you live in Bellhaven? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm Mary Margaret Sutherland. My family lives over on Arlington. Mary Margaret couldn't believe she was riding in the car with Eudora Welty or following her inside her home, although it was only a few blocks from her own. And once inside the house, she was even more awestruck. Go on out on the porch and have a seat while I put these groceries away. I'll bring us some iced tea in a minute. Should she follow her to the kitchen and offer to help? Or would that be too intrusive? So instead, she took a few minutes to peek into a room with a desk and a typewriter, stacks of books and paper everywhere. Was she in the inner sanctum of this world famous writer? Maybe her talent would rub off on Mary Margaret. Back out on the porch, she sat on a small love seat and found herself on the receiving end of some cold iced tea served in a tall, thin crystal glass. As Miss Welty took her seat on a nearby chair, Mary Margaret's mind raced, flooded with questions. Before she could begin, Miss Welty picked up a copy of the New Yorker magazine off a nearby wicker table and handed it to her. Have you seen this yet? It was dated July 6, 1963, just a week earlier. Mary Margaret took the magazine and said, oh, no, ma'am. In fact, I don't believe I've ever seen this magazine at all. What's it about? How old are you, child? I'm 14, just finished ninth grade. Well, I don't imagine you have read The New Yorker yet. Have you seen it around your house? Perhaps your parents read it? Mary Margaret shook her head, feeling somewhat embarrassed for herself and her parents. Should they have? Miss Welty laughed. Well, I guess that depends a bit on their political leanings. Did they vote for Nixon or Kennedy? Uh, Nixon, I believe. I don't really pay that much attention to politics. I'm more into literature, mainly fiction. I want to be a writer. Miss Welty smiled gently. Well, young lady, it's time you learn that you can't learn about the world around you just by reading short stories and novels or by writing them. Where do you think writers get their ideas from? Mary Margaret shrugged, sipped more of her tea, wishing she could be the one asking the questions. Trying to sound more grown up, she asked, well, why did you show me this magazine? Do you have a short story published in it or something? Good question, and indeed I do. Oh good, I was hoping so. Mary Margaret was eager to get away from politics and on to discussing literature. She loved some of Welty's early stories like Why I Live at the P.O. Well, Miss Welty said as she poured more tea, my story in this magazine is called, Where is the Voice Coming From? And I wrote it because of what happened to Medgar Evers last month. You do know who Medgar Evers is, don't you? Oh yes, ma'am, we saw that on the news. Terrible that he was shot. Yes, it is. And I wrote a short story about it the very night of the shooting. It's fiction and it's from the point of view of the killer. So you think what the killer did was right? Mary Margaret was confused now. Oh no, dear, not at all. But I wanted to understand why he did it. What was he thinking? What moved him to do such an awful deed? If you wanna be a writer, or at any rate, a good one, you've got to get into your character's heads, whether they are good or bad. Mary Margaret nodded. Um, could I borrow this so I can read the story? Miss Welty smiled, of course, I've got more copies. Maybe your parents will even read it. Come back and visit another day and tell me what you think. Yes, ma'am, Mary Margaret held the magazine close to her heart like it was a treasure. She wanted to say something intelligent sounding to show Miss Welty she wasn't some dumb kid, but maybe she was. There was so much going on in the world and especially in her hometown that she didn't understand. So that was the summer of 1963, which was an epic time in Jackson, Mississippi and all over the South. Three years later, she's a freshman at Ole Miss and she meets John in uh, an English class and they both love Faulkner. And she's very impressed with how smart he is. And so they decided that they're gonna study together. Again, I had to say, what if? What if they meet at her sorority house to study 
during the fall of their freshman year. And I'm gonna read another excerpt and to set it up a little bit, John and two of his friends, Eddie and Diane, um, are having lunch at the student union um, building. They, they have started the Black Student Union, which actually did start around that time. And so they're really active in um, racial inequality situations on campus. But John and Mary Margaret have met in class and have agreed at Margaret's invitation to study together at the Tridelt House after lunch. So here's the excerpt. Diana looked at Eddie, then back at John and asked, didn't I see you walking with Mary Margaret Sutherland over near Ventress a few minutes ago? Oh well, yeah, we have English class together. Hey, how do you know her name? She's on the Mississippian staff. I've seen her picture there. But hey, don't change the subject. It looks like you two have more than an interest in books. What? She asked me to study with her for an exam. Uh-huh, Diana and Eddie said in unison. Hey, I've got a class. See y'all later. Diana got up and left. Eddie put his arm on John's shoulder and spoke in a serious tone. Just be careful with that white girl, okay? I know we're hoping things will be different soon, but I'm not sure how her white friends are gonna feel about y'all hanging out together. He patted John on the back as he got up to leave. John sat staring at his lunch and realized he had lost his appetite. Should he listen to Eddie's warning? He was nervous as a cat as he walked down sorority row and stopped at the door to the Delta 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 house with his historic brick walls and stately white columns. Should he not? Just as he was trying to decide what to do, a pretty young co-ed came up the steps behind him and said, deliveries are around back. Oh no, I'm not delivering anything. I'm here to see Mary Margaret, Miss Sutherland. We're going to study together. The girl stared at him in disbelief. After a moment of silence, she replied, oh, I see. Well, I guess you can come in then. John held the door open for her and then followed her into the foyer. Girls were coming and going from the nearby dining room where lunch was just finishing up. They were ascending and descending the staircase that led to their sleeping quarters upstairs. An attractive middle-aged woman dressed in a polyester knit suit approached John. May I help you? Yes, ma'am, I'm John Abbott. I'm here to study with Mary Margaret Sutherland. We have English class together. He looked around nervously, wishing he and Mary Margaret had made plans to study at the Grove or the library, anywhere but here. But just then, Mary Margaret came into the foyer. Oh, there you are, John. I see you've met Mrs. Murray, our house mother. We haven't formally met, but John was just telling me he's here to study with you. Is that true? Mrs. Murray's eyes never left John's, even as she addressed her question to Mary Margaret. Yes, ma'am, we've got an English exam coming up. Mary Margaret smiled nonchalantly at John and Mrs. Murray, swinging her ponytail confidently as she moved toward the stairs. John knows more about Faulkner than I do, that's for sure. John hung his head, embarrassed by her compliment. I'll be right back down. I've got to run upstairs and get my notes. Mrs. Murray, will you please show John into the living room? When Mary Margaret got to her room upstairs, her roommate, Shannon, was waiting for her. Oh, hi, Shannon, I didn't see you at lunch. Are you feeling okay? I'm fine. I was working on an art project and lost time, lost track of the time. I'll grab a sandwich later. Mary Margaret did her, redid her ponytail and put on lipstick before grabbing her Faulkner notes. Well, I'm going to study for an exam in the living room. See you later. Wait a minute, Mary Margaret, Shannon stopped her. I think I ran into your study partner when I was coming in the front door a few minutes ago. Oh, you met John? He's so nice and super smart. He's pre-law. I'm sure he's nice, but aren't you concerned at all about, well, about what people are going to think? Think about what, Shannon? Mary Margaret was getting irritated and didn't want to engage in a long conversation about race with Shannon, who grew up on a former plantation in the Mississippi Delta. You know what I mean, just be careful. As I continued writing, I wondered whether or not they would be careful. And if so, I continued to ask myself, what if? What if John takes Mary Margaret on a date to a football game? What if 
afterwards, since there are no black fraternities and they have nowhere else to go on campus, what if he takes her to an all black blues club off campus after the game? And what if, well, let me read another excerpt. This scene happens after a football game when John, and after a night, no, let me see if I'm skipping around. Yeah, and after a night at the blues club, when they end up back at the Tridelt house. They were both quiet on the ride back to campus. And when they pulled up in front of the truck, oh, I need to tell you a little bit before I read this. I just realized this. At the blues club, they dance together. And um, she's the only white person there. It's quite an experience for her. And in the car before they come back to campus, they do kiss. They definitely have some chemistry uh, that has just started up. Now I'll read another excerpt. They were both quiet on the ride back to campus. And when they pulled up in front of the Tridelt house, there were groups of kids everywhere. As John opened the car door for Mary Margaret, several couples approached. Before Mary Margaret could even speak to her sorority sisters who were returning from their parties, one of their dates yelled at John, what do you think you're doing, boy? Before John could answer, the guy charged and punched him in the face. When John started to get up, Another boy kicked him back down on the sidewalk. Mary Margaret jumped from the car and screamed as she knelt to help John, who was conscious but bleeding from the nose and mouth. She looked at the boy who had hit him, a junior basketball player named Jimbo, and his date, her friend, Carol Ann, who did nothing to come to her aid. Mary Margaret yelled up at Jimbo from the sidewalk, are you crazy? He wasn't doing anything wrong, you bigot. She looked pleadingly at Carol Ann who seemed to be frozen in place. By then a crowd had gathered and a couple of other boys pulled Jimbo and his friend away from the sidewalk and the couples all began moving toward the front door of the house. Are you okay? Mary Margaret asked as she helped John to his feet. Do you want me to call the campus police? No, I'm fine, but I think you want to head in, you ought to head inside by yourself. I don't want to cause you any more embarrassment. Embarrassment? You were just assaulted, John. Jimbo and that other idiot are the ones who should be embarrassed or arrested. And how do you think that would play out with nothing but a bunch of white kids as witnesses to what happened? You think they're gonna stick up for me? Just leave it alone, Mary Margaret. Mary Margaret wanted to keep arguing with him to tell him to walk her to the door like the other boys were doing with their dates, but she knew he wouldn't listen. Tears flowed as she watched John walk around to the other side of his car and drive away. So they quit dating. It just wasn't going to work. You know, they, they, they had tried and they just knew. And John was the one who was most concerned. He was most concerned about Mary Margaret and what it was going to do to her life and her future because he had his plan. He was a pre-law and he wanted to be a lawyer and he wanted to become a judge and um, work back in Memphis. His father was a coach, a football coach at an all black high school where his brother uh, played and he eventually played and his brother went to an all black college on a football scholarship, which is what everybody had expected John to do. So he had already really stepped out and done something brave and courageous and different to follow this path at Ole Miss and, and in pre-law and in law. I'm gonna skip over a little bit. I've already told you about the protest at Fulton Chapel. So meanwhile, as they're living their separate lives, here is a little, a little touch of what Mary Margaret's life was like. This is really short. So Mary Margaret has started dating Walker, a boy, a white boy from Memphis. By senior year, Mary Margaret was practice teaching at a local high school and had begun dating a senior from Memphis named Walker Richardson. Walker was everything her mother wished for her. Tall, handsome, popular, and with a secure future, in his father's property development and management business. She was wearing his Sigma Chi pin and hoping for a ring before graduation. She was even chosen as the sweetheart of Sigma Chi, an honor envied by girls all over the campus. Walker and his fraternity brothers serenaded her outside the Tridelt house one night where he presented her with roses and they sang the song popular since 1913. The girl of my dreams is the sweetest girl of all the girls I know. And the moon still beams on the girl of my dreams. She's a sweetheart of Sigma Chi. With John and Mary Margaret seeming to go their separate ways after graduation, John staying at Ole Miss for law school, Mary Margaret moving to Memphis to teach school, I continued to ask myself those two questions. What if? 
What if John and Mary Margaret both end up in Memphis, married to other people, and finally meet 35 years later when their spouses are both residents in the same nursing home suffering from Alzheimer's? So I'll leave it to you to read the book to find out what happens 35 years later. Um, I wanna say a bit about my family and this plays into why I wrote the book. I think I mentioned earlier that I have three adopted kids. The younger two are now, they're all 39, 40, 44 now. The younger two are from South Korea <clears throat> and our daughter married a black man and they have two mixed race granddaughters. And then our Korean son married a Hmong woman and they have two mixed race Asian American daughters. So um, their lives and what their lives are gonna be like with all the racial uh, injustice in this country are very much on my heart. So last summer when the protests were going on, I really wanted to go out and join them. There were a lot of um, peaceful protests going on in Memphis, but there was no COVID vaccine yet. And I was 70 years old and it just wasn't safe. So this is why my husband said to me, you have a voice write it. So this book is me speaking up. And it wasn't for me to decide to put in the inside front of the book for my granddaughters, Grace, Anna, Gabby, and Izzy. May the world embrace you with love and kindness. So that's pretty much uh, my writing journey um, and a little bit about John and Mary Margaret. I didn't read any of the later chapters about what happened to them in their separate lives in Memphis, where I explored uh, a lot of other issues. I will say this, I had a lot of fun with the epilogue because uh, in February of 2020, uh, February of 2020, 50 years after that protest that happened on the Ole Miss campus, um, some people at Ole Miss organized a reunion of the Ole Miss Eight and, and any beyond those eight who had been arrested back then. So there was a reunion uh, in real life. And one of them, the one that the character Diana is modeled after, uh, received her diploma 50 years later that she was denied because she had been arrested. So I decided to write that in the epilogue and have John and Mary Margaret be involved in that reunion, which really did happen. So the book is full of 50 years of civil rights history, factual stuff. You know, John's father being involved in the sanitation worker strike in Memphis and him being torn between staying at Ole Miss or going to Memphis when Martin Luther King was there. You know, because if he got arrested, he might get kicked out and not, not be able to get his law degree. So there's a whole lot of, um, it's a fictional love story set against the backdrop of civil rights history. So I would love it if anybody has any questions or comments about it. I'd love to chat about it. Uh, so um, we're short on time now, uh -oh. but uh, yeah, I will um, I will just say as we sort of wrap things up that I just really felt like this book was a theme through it was about living up to your convictions. Yes. And how there was a dichotomy there. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Well, definitely, because um, Mary Margaret wanted to, but she was afraid. You know, the book has some conversations she had with her house mother, Mrs. Murray, about it. Um, and, you know, she regretted her decision later that she had not hung in there with John. But John felt like he was doing what was best for her. And he very much lived up to his convictions. He's really the hero of the book. And in, in my mind, uh, very much so. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing and reading about the book. I think it's just uh, so apropos that it's written right now and, and something for us to really glean from. And I, I really appreciate your time and thoughts thank and sharing it with us. And thank hope everyone will know. check out the book. We'll go out and buy John and Mary Margaret and read it. And uh, it's available um, <laughs> everywhere books are sold. You know, my, my hometown. Um, bookstore here in Memphis <laughs> yeah. and books, and they will ship the book anywhere. You know, of course, it's available online, but if you just give Novel a call, they've got signed copies. They'd be happy to send you one. That would be great. And hardcover, both. Lynn, Mark, Lynn, did you have I a say? question? Yeah. No, not a question. Um, I, it's a, uh, just a, well, it's a compliment. I want to say, first of all, this is a wonderful book. 
the most important thing is that it's a really good story as a as a reader and as as a person involved in our reading reading conferences in Chattanooga for thank you five years um, and as Southerners, I told you from North Mississippi, uh, Ole Miss graduate, <clears throat> you know, I'm steeped in good literature and good stories. And this was a good story. That's the most important thing. It was a wonderful story. I was drawn into it um, from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, I also want to compliment you on your courage. Uh, this is still uh, a very difficult um, subject in the South, particularly in Mississippi, um, 20 year, 15, 20 years ago, this would have been suicidal. I would have hired, you know, uh, security firms to follow you. <laughs> People who would be upset and angry about this. Uh, and um, they're, they're wrong. Uh, this is this subject, which I have um, e examined and discussed in my own family in detail. I have five children and uh, have just made the statement to my wife and family, uh, siblings, and my children that if we are really support um, racial equality, as it has not been done to this day in America, particularly in the South, this is this is something we must face up and say: if our if a member of our family falls in love with and marries a person of a different race, be the African-American or then we have to judge that person purely, are they a good spouse as we would judge right. the same race? I mean, that, that, that is, that's a crucial thing. It's, it's a crucial step. You know, it's not about, yeah, we're, we can support, we don't have separate water fountains and uh, things like that, but we treat people truly equal. Do we look them in the eye and treat them as a person when they're interacting with them at a bank loan desk in a medical setting, which is where I'm, I'm a physician? Uh, does that person of a different race feel like I'm truly treating them as an equal person? Right. As a part of that, we would I would not be upset or alarmed if they fall in love with and want to marry or have a relationship with a person of a different race. I'm mean, I at that point. I grew up when that was absolutely taboo. I mean, I grew up in rural Mississippi in a farming family, groomed to be a white supremacist. And I, and I didn't, mainly because of my father. And there's a footnote about my father, Earl Anderson, in Kenneth Mayfield's book. Oh, awesome. That when I read that, I read his book. I didn't, of course, I didn't know you. Or it's know a very tiny about. thing. Earl Anderson is a footnote that okay. he recognized as a fair man. And, and that's what I felt about my father. And for Kenneth Mayfield to say that uh, reduced me to tears. Oh, well, that's awesome. Well, you know, uh, John, John and Mary Margaret has a lot of quotes in it. Um, yes. This is a really short one, but uh, I think it'd be great to close with. It speaks to what you're saying. Yes. This is William Faulkner. And he says, never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. Mm -hmm. nice. you're, a, you're a part of that. And, and thank yeah. you. Thank you for writing this book. Thank, thank you for reading. Please share thanks it. for sharing it with us tonight. We yes. really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Linda and Mark, both of y'all. Thanks so much. Great. Well, thank you all. We'll wrap that up and uh, we hope to see everybody at our next Southbound Author Series and at Southward Abridged in November. Take care. Bye.